Few things have impacted the development of humanity more than water. It is essential for all human life as our bodies are roughly composed of 60% water if you're an adult male and 55% if you're an adult female. But let's be fair here, girls don't use the internet so disregard that latter statistic. While water covers 71% of Earth's surface, only a small fraction of the water is fresh water, and the majority of that water is either suspended in the air as vapor or frozen into ice caps at the poles of the globe. And yet, such a small quantity of something so common and abundant ended the Neolithic period of humanity and allowed us to develop into one of only two species on Earth which fit into our definition of civilization. Approximately 7,000 years ago, a settlement sprang up on the marshy regions of where the Euphrates River met with the Mediterranean Sea. A civilization came into being, purportedly the very first city ever constructed by humanity. This place, now modernly known as Tel Abu Sharain in modern Iraq, was once called by the Sumerians Iraidu. The Sumerians foretold that their first line of kings came from this region, beginning with King Alulim, who ruled in line with his descendants for a ridiculously long time, 129,600 years split between four separate kings. And you thought the people of the Bible lived there for a ridiculously long amount of time. It's also within this city that Enki, whom some of you should remember from our video on the Sumerian creation story, built his almighty palace of Apsu, which of course was named for the embodiment of fresh water in the Sumerian mythos, though not out of honor. From there, the rest of the city and its canals were carved out by the Igigi, or lesser gods, until such a point where these deities rebelled against the Anunnaki, or greater gods. The Anunnaki, seeking to resolve this slave rebellion without bloodshed, created a whole new race of slaves out of the bloodshed by the god Alia who gave himself willingly to be sacrificed for this endeavor, mirroring the Babylonian account of the same thing happening, but with the blood vessels of the captive god Kingu. Now with a new race of slaves working under them, the gods left the humans alone to finish their work, finishing Araidu for the glory of Enki before spreading out and building four other cities named Lorak, Sipar, Sharupak, and Bad Tibra. Alright folks, get your boomer jokes out of the way now. Oh, then what happened to good Tibera? Uh, I'm so funny and imaginative, I have no idea why my children don't visit me and left me in this nursing home to rot. All right, shut up. However, the city would not remain the focal point of humanity for long, as after chilling out to Naraidu for nearly 130 millennia, a great flood ravished the land, forcing their inhabitants to migrate north towards not-so-greener pastures, more specifically the new city of Uruk, which is one of the big boy names in Mesopotamia. Of course, this was merely a natural phenomenon. However, the Sumerians couldn't help themselves and decided to not to write one, but two myths concerning this migration. The first deals with how the flood got started, which again mirrors the Babylonian creation story we already covered on this channel. Except this time it's not the gods, but rather the humans who grew to become a bit too overpopulated over the course of about 1200 years, and consequently became too noisy for the gods' liking, and hence they decided to do a little bit of population control. The earliest version of this myth we presently have knowledge of is that of King Zisudra of Shurupak, who was warned by Enki that the gods were conspiring to wipe out all of humanity with a great flood. However, because the story is so old and written on stone tablets with a tendency to break, all prior knowledge as to the specifics of the boat, as well as its cargo, are lost to history. However, when the tablet picks back up, Zeusudra is rewarded by the gods, not just because he chose to prostrate himself in front of them despite their divine wrath of destroying everything he ever knew and loved with exception to his immediate family, but also for preserving all of the world's animals and human seed for generations to come. Which sounds vaguely familiar. The second version of this myth we have is that of Atrahasis, and is thought to have been a later account of the same myth, only this time hailing from the city of Acadia. In this version of events, the gods put up with humanity for 1200 years after their creation until the noise drives them mad, and so they vow to destroy humanity by way of a plague. This works well enough the first time around, but then the wise old man Atrahasis eventually has enough of this sickness and pleads with Anki to stop the spread of the plague. Anki responds that if humanity is to get back into the good graces of the gods, they should honor the god of plagues, Namtar, 
by building a great temple in his honor and gifting him loaves of freshly baked bread as an offering to stop the plague. Namtar, seeing as he liked bread as much as an 18th century French nobleman, took pity on the poor scrubs and retracted his plague after they did so. So let that be a lesson to you, kiddos. You don't stop the spread of corona with some flimsy cloth masks. All you really have to do is offer empty carbs to the evil entity which created it. I mean, it was about time for China to start eating normal food anyway. Anyhow, humanity was spared for another 1200 years until they again began to create too much noise. And this time, the gods contracted Edad, yeah, I've always wanted one of those too, to hold back the rain and create a drought to wilt the crops and evaporate the watering holes. Atrahasis pleads again to Anki to stop the drought because apparently he's the only god who will actually do anything. Anki tells them to essentially do the same thing they did with Namtar, except this time with Adad. And so the people rallied behind Atrahasis again, and they built a temple to offer bread to the god of rain. Long story short, the same thing happens again, the gods relent, and the drought ends. Let that be another lesson to you, kiddos. If you want your dad to come back with those cigarettes he went out for 18 years ago, just follow my lead. And now we play the waiting game. Uh, by the way, as a quick aside, how did they make the bread this time if they were in the middle of the drought which supposedly killed all their wheat and dried up their water? Well, damn it, there goes my infamous cynicism again. Anyhow, the gods run into this problem of overpopulation six more times! And each time, they keep alternating between plagues and droughts, only for the humans to bake them some more bread and appease them once again. Listen, if you keep setting traps for mice and all they ever do is come scurrying back like the vermin they are, your exterminator isn't faulty. The structural integrity of your house is. Finally, the chief of the gods, who in this version is Elil, has an original idea for once and instead decides that the best way to kill the pests is, is to call down a massive flood. Anki declared that he would have no part in this insipid plot to kill all of humanity, and so came to Atrahasis in a dream, warning him of the impending flood and instructing him to... Build a boat and fill it with his family and two of all species of animals. Welp, looks like we have a case of plagiarism on our hands here. Well, a good story can only be told so many times before people start catching on. I mean, it's not like some place like Babylonia is going to write their own apocalyptic flood myth next. Yeah, am I right, guys? Guys? Well, to be fair, they don't. They just shoehorn it into the earliest epic tale in recorded history. Gilgamesh, yes, that Gilgamesh, comes across a man on his travels called Utnapishtim, who was a holy man who found favor with the gods, who were seeking to punish the earth and all its inhabitants with a great flood. Enki, now going under the Babylonian name of Ea, warns Utnapishtim in a dream of the oncoming flood and tells him to build a boat. Ten dozen cubits long and ten dozen cubits wide. Utnapishtim then tears down his house and sets to work building an ark, on which he loads his family, some local craftsmen, and two of each animal. Again, plagiarism. However, whoever the hell it was who wrote Gilgamesh had the good consciousness to incorporate some original elements, such as the ark landing on a mountain, Utnapishtim releasing a dove, who came back to the ship since it did not find dry land. The next day, he sends out a swallow when the same thing happens again. The third day, he sends out a raven, which does not come back, and so dry land was found. As a reward for... <sighs> Saving the animals and the human seed, Utnapishtim is granted eternal life by the gods, and then the rest of Gilgamesh happens, and we'll get around to that video when we get around to it. I just have one more asshole who built a boat and survived an apocalyptic flood to talk about. Okay, look. I know some of you are going to be peeved by me mentioning this, 
but the tale of Noah's Ark is very clearly ripped from Gilgamesh, who clearly ripped it from Atrahasis, who clearly ripped it from Zisudra, which might have been based on an actual event which forced the settlers of Araidu to move northward away from the Mediterranean to Uruk, which, by the way, was reinstated as the city of the gods by Inanna, who retrieved the secrets of civilization called Mess from the remnants of Araidu and shared them with Uruk. Now, to the Jews' credit, the score of which is higher than mine, they were not the only people from the land surrounding the Cradle of Humanity who retold the Flood myth. The Persians, Egyptians, and Indians all had their own versions which follow the same story beats, only they are retold with their respective gods. Hell, the Greeks even wrote two Flood stories, though the second one was far more isolated than the first and only punished the city of Athens for thinking that these things were more valuable than trade routes connecting them to the rest of the world and so Poseidon drowned them all. That, that one may not count. That one may be wholly original. Hark! What is that noise I hear off in the distance? Some smooth brain commenting that the flood myths appear all over the world, including mythologies where these people wouldn't have a chance to even hear about the Mesopotamians until centuries after their stories have been shared? Hence meaning that there is a distinct possibility that the world actually had been flooded some many moons ago, and all of these cultures are recounting the exact same event, just under different pretexts? Well, I'd hate to burst your bubble, but no. First of all, it's impossible for the entire Earth to become completely submerged in liquid water. You'd have to melt all the ice on Earth, and then completely collapse in the entire atmosphere to free up all that pent-up water vapor, at which point a little bit of flood water is the least of your concerns. Secondly, let's take time to consider what I have already stated at the beginning of this video. Most every civilization, with very few exceptions, began around the basin of some sort of body of water. Even today, 40% of the United States population is situated on either one of its coasts. And that doesn't even begin to mention all the major metropolitan areas built near or around major bodies of water, such as the Hudson, Mississippi, and Ohio rivers. Yes, rivers have a tendency to flood and displace these populations, but that's just part of life for many ancient peoples. Also, take into consideration the fact that the majority of these people were peasant farmers who probably never saw the outside of their city's walls and very rarely heard tales from outside lands. If a flood overtook their home, that's it. That was, hypothetically speaking, their entire world. We also need to consider the fact that mythology, aside from the creation stories, is typically fan fiction of real life with major historical events embellished with the presence of gods, wars lasting way too long, kings who seemingly live forever, and overly glorified heroes who are sometimes proclaimed to be immortal if you overlook small discrepancies in their feet. If all of these events can be over-exaggerated to the point of making the mundane totally fantastic, then who is to say that the fantastic destruction of a major city cannot be overly exaggerated into the fantastic destruction of the entire planet? Now that we have that clarified, I'm not going to spend too long on Noah, as this is easily the most famous of all the Flood myths, and I'm sure most of you get the gist of it. If not, it's basically Gilgamesh minus the immortality bits. I'd actually argue that all the interesting stuff starts happening to Noah after the Flood, because there's a Bible story I want to do a whole stream on at some point, just because it's so great. But only my second favorite story from the Bible, actually. Oh, don't you worry, new episodes of Quadruple B are coming up soon. But for now, let's quickly go over a few more Mediterranean Flood myths before we go ahead and call it a day, shall we? Let's start off with the Greeks because, well, they're the Greeks. So it starts out with a pretty standard fare. Towards the end of the Golden Age of Humanity, some say it was the Bronze, people were starting to act a bit unruly, practicing such wickedness as cannibalism, which for obvious reasons Zeus takes quite a lot of exception to. And so he decides to just start over with a clean slate, and so commissions his brother Poseidon to wash over the kingdoms of humanity with a gigantic flood. Prometheus, titan creator of mankind and arguably the true hero of Greek mythology, forewarned his son Deucalion of the impending flood and instructs him to take his wife and build a giant chest, 
then stack it full of enough provisions to last them until the nine day flood was all over. The flood comes, it kills everyone except for Deucalion and Pyra, and then they come to rest on a mountainside where they receive instructions for how to repopulate from Zeus, which surprisingly for him isn't totally sexual in nature. He tells them to take the bones of their mother and cast them over their shoulder. Pyra is a bit confused as neither one of them thought to bring dear old mom along so that they could skin her alive and cast her bones behind them. However, Deucalion was watching his messiahs in mythology, so he knew that the bones Zeus was referring to were the rocks of the mountainside, which are the bones of the mother goddess Gaia. And so, shortly thereafter, the rocks transformed themselves into the next generation of humanity. And, well, things go back to normal. Or about as normal as Greek mythology can be. Now, I have three notes on this particular myth, which may be of interest to some of you. So first and foremost, Deucalion's name literally means forethought, which is kind of narratively fitting for this story, as only someone with the right amount of forethought could have been able to build a chest to save their life, ration their food, and bring their fresh squeeze along in hopes of repopulating the planet. Though this doesn't really work, because Prometheus literally just tells him what to do, and then Zeus tells him what to do, and there really wasn't much of his own forethought contributed to this tale. Secondly, I'd like to point out that the stones becoming people is actually a play on words. You see, stones in ancient Greek are las, whereas the word for people is laos. Not nearly as clever in my opinion as calling people with a foot fetish petty files, but I digress. Finally, I'd like to address the seeming similarity to this story and that of Noah's Ark. Many have pointed out in recent times that Noah's boat inexplicably shares the same name as the chest built to house the commandments of the Ark of the Covenant, leading some to believe that Noah built a giant chest rather than a boat. Allow me to clear some things up because there are quite a few things which got lost in translation here. Surprise, surprise. So the word used to describe Noah's... let's call it a flotation device in Old Hebrew is Teva. This word only appears twice in the whole entire Old Testament, both to describe this floating fortress and, interestingly enough, the basket which housed the baby Moses as he was sent down the Nile River. Aran is the name given to the container of Jehovah's commandments and is later used to describe the coffin of Joseph, the one who was almost murdered by his brothers, not the one who literally got cucked by God himself. Now, while it is true that both of these words mean a storage container of sorts, so the postulation that Noah's Ark was really a chest similar to Deucalion's method of escape is plausible, however, the assertion that it's because we use the word Ark in English is incorrect, as the Pentateuch makes it clear that there are differences between the two arcs. Tevas are thought to be storage containers which are capable of floating on water, such as the case of Noah's Teva and Moses' basket. However, there is also a postulation that what is stored inside the container is what determines the differences between a Teva and an Aaron, as Tevas are in both cases carrying living cargo, whereas the Aarons are holding stone tablets and a corpse respectively, meaning they were earthbound containers of non-living things. The etymology gets a bit more involved from there, but I'll leave an article in the description for anyone who wants to read up a bit more on that. For the most part, I think I've proven my point about Greek mythology possibly taking influence from the Mesopotamian sources for their own flood story. So, moving on to another contentious religion from that region. So this one, much like everything from Zoroastrianism, shakes up the formula a bit. You might initially think that the world was flooded by the evil god Ahriman, but in fact, the flood foretold in the creation story of Zoroaster does actually say it was caused by Ahura Mazda, but it was not meant to erase humanity. Quite the opposite, in fact. So in the early war between Ahriman and Ahura Mazda, our favorite OG Satan had attempted to cast a plague of scorpions, poisonous frogs, and venomous snakes after Geomar the original man. One of Ahura Mazda's agents by the name of Tish Trya sees this coming, however, and prepares a massive flood to cover the earth and drown all the pests sent by Ahriman. However, he keeps the water level low enough so that Geomar, who I forgot to mention in my Zoroastrianism video is actually a giant, didn't really have to do anything except take a harmless bath. There is also an alternate account of this myth wherein Ahriman instead just tries to kill the planet through a massive drought, 
which is put to an end by Mithra, who shoots an arrow into the side of a rock, shooting out a spring of water which floods the earth, though again spares Gaomart and his cattle. By the way, let me gush here for a second about how much I would love this religion. Unlike others, which kind of play it fast and loose with the morality of their gods, which creates a need for apologetics. Oh, I'm sorry. Zoroastrianism takes an older myth based on a historical event and recontextualizes it so that the flood wasn't a result of a peeved off divine figure, but instead a purely benevolent one who implores the use of a destructive flood to protect and preserve humanity. I don't care what any of you have to say, Zoroastrianism is great. Just not as great as Shintoism or Hinduism fight me. And speaking of Hinduism, yes, despite their relative geographical isolation from the rest of the world, India actually has a worldwide flood myth too. So in this one, our hero named Manu, the first man, was out and about one day bathing in a river when all of a sudden he pulled up a clay jar full of water and a magical talking fish, sadly not named Wanda, poked his head out and told Manu that if he were to keep him and take care of him until he was fully grown, he would save Manu from a terrible calamity which would befall the land. Manu, naturally curious, asked the fish what he means, and the fish replies that a massive flood would soon be coming to destroy all of humanity unless they prepared themselves accordingly. Manu decides to heed the advice of the fish and keeps him in the clay jar for safekeeping, upgrading him to a larger jar each time the fish grew some more, until it Eventually, it fully matured into a gasha, one of the largest fish in the world. After which, Manu built his boat, set out with a small party of people he actually liked, and then tied the boat to the dorsal fin of the gasha, which navigated the floodwaters and eventually led Manu and his companions onto dry land. On a mountaintop. Gee, I wonder when the next schmuck is gonna park his boat. Plot twist! It's Ireland. Yeah, Celtic mythology is one of those European belief systems which got transparently tainted by the Christian Bible and thus this flood myth pulls no punches in mentioning Noah by name and makes it abundantly clear to everyone that this is fucking Bible fanfiction bullshit along the same lines of canonicity as fucking Bible man, veggie tales, or chatter fucking chipmunk. To preface this, a brief yet speculatory history of the Celtic and Germanic peoples. Way back in the day, Central Western Germany gave rise to Twitter's favorite scapegoat, white people. However, white people be cray cray, so they went off in separate directions, with the eastern half of Europe becoming dominated by the Germanic peoples and their subsidiaries, and the western half became inhabited by the Celtic people and their subsidiaries. Both tribes tried to expand northward, with the Germanic peoples breeding the Norse and the Celts breeding... the... the Celts. That was an incredibly simplified account of the movement von glorious Vreses of Deutschland, but oh no 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 no. The Bible has to keep things nice and tidy, so all races on Earth actually originated from one country, by the graces of one god, and to make things even more confusing are the genetic byproduct of one man. And that, of course, is Noah. So, according to later generation Christians, Noah had a fourth son, which was never mentioned in Genesis, called Bith. And he had a daughter named Kasser, who was told by an Egyptian priest to get the fuck out of Dodge and take several arcs full of women along with her as an ominous catastrophe was on the horizon. Gee, I wonder what that could be. So, Kasser built three separate arcs and made exclusive girl clubs which men wouldn't be allowed to board unless they acknowledged acknowledge Kasser as their leader, which only their father and two other guys did. I suppose it bears mentioning before anyone decries this tale as sexist that Kasser was only 10 years old at the time, so I guess it's a bit more ageist because these men assume that a 10 year old girl building a fleet of ships in preparation for a supposed worldwide flood because her grandfather from a foreign land heard it from his god who was more legitimate than the other gods because reasons is not at all legitimate. Yeah, I would probably be gargling water too. They sailed for about seven years before arriving on the shores of Ireland. However, during this time, only one ship survived, which conveniently housed Bith, Ladra, and Fintan, who is important for later. So, in accordance with the fact there's plenty of underage girls go around, the 50 surviving women are shared among the three men. However, Bith and Ladra are soon snoo snooed to death, and so Fintan is left with 50 different wives. Not being able to bear the pressures of being a hentai protagonist, Fintan flees to a hill called... 
Told Twinje? I'm sure some angry, drunken Irish lad is going to correct my pronunciation in the comments. They always do. Of course, this is when the floodwaters actually come in and drown all the women, leaving Finton as the lone survivor who transforms himself into a salmon, then gets bored of that and transforms into an eagle, then gets bored of that and transforms into a hawk before the waters recede and he can go back to being a human man again. How can Finton change himself into whatever animal he wants on a whim? I don't know. Does this story have anything to do with Irish Celtic mythology other than flimsily connecting it to the Bible, thus making me included in this video? Not really, no. Should we just move along to the epilogue before I ask too many questions and am burned at the stake by Il Papa and the neo-pagans alike? Eh, sure. Thanks to everyone for watching today's video. I thought I'd do something a little bit different and cover a topic that has some widespread implications throughout various different mythologies and the possible historical event which may have inspired them. If you partially enjoyed today's video and learned even less, go ahead and like the video and I guess subscribe for... I don't know, 2,000 subscribers? Honestly, I didn't think Susan would let me get this far. But nonetheless, I really appreciate each and every one of you and the outpouring of support I've been getting for making shitty little videos based on my nerdy little hobby. I've met some really great people and have had a blast so far. So hopefully whatever the future has in store for me and this channel will be equally as great. And we haven't even hit our stride yet, folks. We've still got plenty of videos in the works, including that Halloween collab between me and six other awesome mythology content creators, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Obvious upload date is obvious. We've also got some other cool shit in store for you guys later on down the line, so I guess stay tuned for that. Alright, ladies and gentlemen of the internet, like I always say at the end of every one of these videos, my name is Messiahs of Mythology, and I hope you have a God's blessed day.